Hey everybody, Steve here, and today in this video, I'm hoping to get through this video. This is the second time I've tried to post this, and the uh, uh, the webcam upload just seems to be having problems. It cuts off right in the middle, and I'm not sure why. So Lord, please let this video go forth and uh, preach the message that it's supposed to. Uh, so anyway, here's the thing. I've had some people, I've talked to some people, and I've gotten some messages from people uh, being Christians, believers, following God as New Testament believers and saying, hey, well, you know, it's, it's my understanding that as long as I follow the seven Noahide laws, I'm good to go. What say it thou? You know, and it's like, well, it doesn't really matter what I say. Okay, it doesn't matter what your pastor says. It doesn't matter what the uh, the seminary professor says or the Bible college, uh, you know, who's he, what's he graduate guy. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really even matter what uh, anybody else says. It's, it matters what the whole counsel of God says. Um, <clears throat> Yeshua said, heaven and earth will pass away, but me and my words will last forever. And we know that God in the beginning was the word, the word was flesh, and it became flesh, and, and he became flesh. And uh, so we see that Yeshua and the Father are one. He says, I am the Father one. Yeshua also said that I don't preach anything of my own. I preach what the Father gives me. I don't have any authority, but I just, I just preach and, pre and preach repent or perish to go back what was originally taught in the beginning. Uh, so that's very interesting. So we see that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what's interesting is that when we start grasping at these things and saying, you know, well, I don't, I don't need to follow God's instructions, which bring long life and blessing and uh, so many other blessings that we try to claim today as New Testament believers, but yet we don't want the responsibility of, of having to obey uh, the instructions of God. So man has come up with these things like the seven Noahide laws to say, you know, well, if we just follow these things, we'll be blessed of God. And that's all we have to do as New Testament believers, as New Covenant believers. Uh, the problem is there's a lot left out when we start categorizing our obedience to God in just seven different areas of our life. Our life is so multifaceted and uh, the ball is going to be dropped on some areas. So again, you have to look at what is the history, what is the origin of these seven Noahide laws, how does it relate to us being New Testament believers and what Scripture says, and are there examples in the New Testament uh, that maybe cause conflicts or does with the seven Noahide laws or uh, the other way around, do the seven Noahide laws conflict with Scripture in providing a false sense of security, a false sense of righteousness before God? Or is there really more that we need to let God into our lives? That's what I say. But uh, when we look at the seven Noahide laws, the seven laws of Noah, you can see, look it up on Wikipedia and a bunch of different sites, so I'm going to refer to some notes. But actually, these are a set of moral imperatives that were given, and it's talked about in the Talmud. Now, you might be wondering what the Talmud is. Uh, so many people say, ooh, the Talmud's evil, it's, it's wicked. Um, but yet the Talmud is just a commentary on the Old Testament. <clears throat> That's all it is. So it's interesting that people uh, who say that the Talmud, a commentary is evil, will today as New Testament or New Covenant believers, that they will uphold uh, their favorite Bible commentary and Henry and Ryrie and, and uh, Thompson Chain Center reference, who's he, what's he, and whatever, you know, whatever their favorite commentary is that supports their point of view, uh, they'll uphold that person and say, well, this is how it is. But yet, so you see the, the conflict there. So instead of following commentaries, let's compare everything to the whole counsel of God and see how it stands up to God's word. Again, Yeshua said, you know, heaven and earth is going to pass away, but me and my words are going to last forever. So it's a pretty good bet that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus said, Yeshua said, that I am the Father in one, and I don't preach of my own accord, but what the Father has given me to preach. So if we stick with what we see in Scripture as the whole counsel of God and don't pull anything out of context, but we look at it all, then we'll pretty got, we got a, a better chance of staying on the straight and narrow path than is than if we take the commandments and the traditions of men. And that's what I want to point out in these seven Noahide laws. It's interesting because a lot of television pastors and television preachers and evangelists and TBN, I mean stars and all that stuff, that they're jumping on this bandwagon of, oh, we're champions for the Noahide laws. Well, let's look at the Noahide laws and see if there's anything lacking. Because unfortunately, that's what the enemy does, is he wants to create a lawless group of people 
that don't observe or obey God and don't do what is pleasing in his sight, but rather are rebellious and disobedient. And so they'll, they'll set up things like this. So let's take a look at it. Uh, it's interesting because, again, going back to the Talmud, these were the seven uh, sets of law for the children of Noah. And most people don't understand that it's for all mankind. It's interesting because in Judaism, any non-Jew who follows these laws is regarded as a righteous Gentile. Now, first of all, we have to look at the word Gentile. The word Gentile means without covenant. In other words, a person who is not in covenant with God. So, and then we have to look at the word righteous, one who does right before God in a biblical aspect. So what we see is, how can a person who is not in covenant with God, who hasn't asked forgiveness, who doesn't believe in him, and doesn't, uh, you know, ask for the forgiveness of his sins, and doesn't follow God, how can that person be righteous by snubbing his nose at all the laws that God gave, all the instructions that God gave, and just follow these seven? That doesn't really make sense. It doesn't because it simply doesn't. So anyway, uh, it's kind of interesting because six of the, it used to be the six Noahide laws, but the, the seventh one uh, wasn't added, or six and seventh wasn't added until later on. Now these are the, the seven Noahide laws. Uh, not to commit adultery, don't commit murder, uh, the prohibition of theft, sexual immorality, blasphemy, prohibition of eating flesh taken from an animal while it is still alive. <clears throat> the re requirement of maintaining courts to provide a legal recourse. So it's interesting that six of these commandments were supposedly given to Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, according to the Talmud's interpre interpretation of Genesis 2.16. And the seventh precept with the courts uh, was given or brought about after the flood of Noah. So it's really interesting here that how, as a Gentile believer, or as a New Testament, New Covenant believer, how can I reduce... Uh, all the stuff that I'm supposed to be obedient to God and clearly seen in the New Testament, do away with a bunch of those things and just stick to these seven. You can't do it. Now, it's really interesting because even if we look in Acts 15 where Paul is talking about it, and it's the, the addressing question is, well, what about the Gentile believers? What about the, the, the foreigners who are following God? What do we tell them to do? Uh, to not strangle things. Don't drink blood. Wow, that automatically is a conflict between the Noahide laws and what Paul, the apostle to the Gentile, taught. And even that goes back to the Old Testament where God says, hey, don't drink the blood because that's where the life is. Okay, um, <clears throat> So automatically we see problems with that right there and the other things that were given. So it's not an all-encompassing seven. So when I see people, television preachers and from TBN and other folks that jump up and say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, and, and I'm only, you know, we're only supposed to follow the seven Noahide laws. Well, actually, God never gave the seven Noahide laws like God gave the Ten Commandments. It wasn't, they weren't written on tablets of stone. But these are just commentaries of what people thought, hey, these are some good things for people that are not in covenant with God, who don't have a relationship with God. This is how they should treat us and how they should treat other people. Uh, it's kind of like our Constitution of the Bill of Rights. You have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that you shouldn't go against the rights of other citizens. You can do whatever you want as long as you don't go against the rights of other citizens. It's kind of like the same thing. But yet, as we saw with Acts chapter 15 of uh, the four things that Paul brought up and the other things that he brought up for the foreigners who followed after God, um, there are some problems because Paul says, hey, you're not supposed to drink the blood um, and things of that nature. So there's automatically problems. The other thing that we see, if that wasn't enough to show that the seven Noahide laws are a problem for Christian believers, is that we see Yeshua talking about, and he says, you know, uh, for example, when he, they're sitting at the temple and the disciples are there and they're watching all these rich people come through who are giving big bags of money out of the excess, putting it in the offering plate, so to say, in the, in the offering box. And he's just looking and saying, hey, he's, he's looking into their hearts and he's saying, wow, dirty heart. You're giving a lot of money. That's not going to cover up the hole in your heart. That's not going to cover up your sin and iniquity and the continued wickedness that you have in your life. Sure, you can look like uh, you're righteous, but on the inside, uh, giving money and putting money in the offering plate isn't going to cut it. But yet when the old woman, the poor widow, came up and gave those two mites uh, that was like worth half a penny or something like that, 
That's what God laid on her heart to give. Even though she was poor, she didn't have to give. But God laid it on her heart to give those things, and that's when he said, hey, she has given more than any of these people. And so what we see there is we see other passages where Yeshua talks about uh, give in secret so that your Heavenly Father may reward you in secret. We see other passages later after the Gospels where it says, you know, uh, don't give with compulsion, but give, be a cheerful giver. Hmm. Isn't it interesting that the words of Yeshua and uh, the, the disciples and the other people who wrote the Bible, uh, we see conflicts with the seven Noahide laws because it mentions nothing about charity whatsoever. So I find it really interesting that there's a lot of television evangelists uh, who have gotten on the Noahide uh, wagon, so to speak, who now follow all these things and they're under no compulsion whatsoever to be charitable. And so it's interesting that a lot of these charities, when uh, they were uh, the giving that you give money to these TBN preachers and things like that, to the majority of them, uh, it doesn't go to the mission field. It doesn't go to, to feeding the hungry as much. The majority of it goes to, uh, you know, multi-million dollar mansions and Laird jets and Ro multiple Rolls Royces and uh, Rolex watches and uh, $10,000 a night hotel stays. And it's just disgusting because what they have done is they have re reduced the relationship that we are supposed to have with God. And when he pours on our, onto our heart to bless somebody, either through prayer, prayer or physically giving them something or an encouraging word or motivating and doing that in love with the gifts combined with the gifts of the Spirit, uh, we see that the Noahide laws are lacking. Uh, so, you know, for those who say, you know, well, well, my Talk to an individual who their favorite TBN preacher said that, uh, you know, well, this person follows the Noahide laws, and that's a great thing. And it's like, no, it really isn't. Um, because we still see in a lot of those TBN preachers, we see them in continued sin. We see them uh, bowing to mammon and greed. Uh, we see them lying to the people. We see them caught in acts of adultery, uh, divorce, and marriage, and divorce again, and homosexuality, and, and drug abuse, and alcohol, uh, false prophecies, false teachings, and yet n none of these people have repented and ask for forgiveness and step down from ministry. They continue on, they jump on the next boat, the next hot thing, and the hot thing today is the Noahide laws, and the other hot thing is the Messianic movement, uh, but yet they never, ever, Hal Lindsey is a prime example. How many times did he prophesy that uh, the rapture was going to return, and yet all the money that he got from, from his books is saying the rapture is going to happen, and, and uh, he never repented. He never went before the body. He never did made a video. He never never made an announcement and put it in newspapers and saying, hey, I made a false prophecy. I'm stepping down from ministry. Now, it might seem like I'm picking on Hal Lindsey, Hal Lindsey but uh, it's true. And there are so many other people. There is uh, that Mr. Wisenant, who had 88 reasons for the rapture in 1988. Uh, he made millions of dollars, and yet the rapture never happened in 88. And did he apologize? Did he repent? Uh, did he confess? Did he step down from ministry? Did he say that, hey, I, I followed something that was false and I purported it as being the word of God and it wasn't? No. He did another book called 89 Reasons Why the Rapture is Going to Happen in 1989. So again, and we see people like Benny Hinn who have jumped on to kind of the same thing and, and saying they get on this, uh, you know, going back to the, to the Hebrew roots and, and to following the instructions of God, and yet they've never repented of uh, the false teachings and the false spirits and the false Christ that they follow. Uh, Benny Hinn actually prayed to kill people, that God told him to kill people, to pray to kill people, uh, to put curses on people. And yet, what does Yeshua say? Yeshua says, bless those that curse you, do good to those that hate you because it will be like heaping coals upon their head. Uh, we're not supposed to act like the world. We're not supposed to curse people. Um, there, we're, there's already a system of blessings and cursings, and if you're obedient to God, you're blessed. If, if you're disobedient, you're rebellious to God, guess what? You're going to be cursed because you're choosing to transgress the law, and that's what the New Testament says. The sin is transgression of the law. So it's interesting that while the seven Noahide laws, um, it's... It's not, I can't even say it's a good start. I used to, been there and done that. I used to say, you know, the, the, the no hide laws are a good thing. But unfortunately, I can't say that anymore because I've tested against the whole counsel of God. And that's just, uh, you know, there's other things. Even if you go to Jeremiah 31, 
the passage where God talks about the new covenants. He says, in the new, I will make a new covenant where I will write my laws, uh, my laws on your hearts and your minds. I will forgive your sins and wipe away your iniquity. And I'll remember it no more. God didn't say, follow the seven Noahide laws, did he? No, he didn't. So automatically, what we see here is the enemy kind of sneaking in and saying, hey, you don't have to worry about having a relationship with God and doing what pleases the Father. Don't, you know, you can go ahead and be involved in abominations by not observing the Sabbath and the, fe the feast of the Lord as long as you just do these seven. You're good. You're okay. But yet God calls that lawlessness. Yeshua states that many in the last days will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we drive out demons? Didn't we do all these great things? And he's going to turn to them and say, depart from me, I never knew you, indicating they didn't have a relationship with him. You workers of iniquity or you workers of lawlessness is, is the uh, more correct translation in the Greek. Lawlessness. Breaking God's law. Sin is transgression of the law. So those who transgress the instructions and the laws of God, which is meant for our benefit, go ahead and do that by doing these seven Noahide laws as a Christian, as a believer. Wow, you've already, you've already, you know, what is, what is God talk about where, you know, his religion is taking care of the widows and, widows and orphans and feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. Uh, we see these things throughout scripture of taking care of those who, who need help. And yet, what do we do? We say, no, let's totally remove charity and letting our light shine before men by doing God's good works by removing it from the seven Noahide laws. We're not even going to put that in there. So who do you think benefits most God by us following the seven Noahide laws and ignoring the laws and instructions that God has written on our hearts? Or the enemy benefits from saying, hey, just do these seven and you're good. Yeah, wow. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting that it leads out the Sabbath where we see in Zechariah, uh, we see Zechariah 14 and we see other passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel. Um, it's Isaiah 66 where it actually talks about that all flesh will come and worship God Sabbath to Sabbath, new moon, festival and festival and things of that nature. Now some people will say, well that just means it's a period of time. But if you actually do your homework and research, you'll find out that the Israelites and the Jews, that they never use that type of terminology to indicate time. So automatically you're lacking. But if you look at Zechariah 14, you'll see that it says uh, in, after the Messiah comes back that all the nations of the world, all mankind, guess what? Will observe the feast. And they have the Feast of Tabernacles. And those that don't, it won't rain on them. And we see mentions of Sabbaths and things like that. So it's really interesting that God says that the Sabbath, which is a sign between me and my people, and it's set apart for us. It's for us to rest. I mean, how, how can you be blessed when God says rest? It is amazing on how simple God is. And yet he just wants us to take time to relax. Now, some people get caught up in saying, you know, well, the Sabbath, that's been done away with. No, it hasn't uh, because of the passages I just showed you. Yeshua said he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He didn't say he is the Sabbath. He gives rest, and it's a different, there's a different Greek word there than what we see for, in the Greek for sabbaton or Sabbath, okay? So don't get those two confused, which a lot of people will do. And again, why do I bring this up? Because it leads people into lawlessness. Now, it's interesting because should we follow God as a, as a list of rules? Here's the list of rules. I'm going to do this today. Sorry. Okay, I did that. Yep, yep now. Oh, man, now i got to do these other things today. Oh, I forgot that one. i got to go back. i got to follow this law. No, it is not a law that we begrudgingly follow, but it's a law that is a byproduct of our relationship to God. Just as, like when I tell my daughter when she was little, hey, you need to wash your hands before you eat. And she does that. And the reason that she does that is, is to wipe away the germs and, and all those bad things on our hands that, come, that we come in contact with all day so that when we eat and put food into our body that we don't get sick, okay? But when you try to explain that to a two- or a three-year-old, they don't understand. So we give these instructions even though our children don't understand. God does the same thing with his instructions in the Word. Hmm, kind of interesting. So even though there are some things that... Uh, people didn't understand back then that does not negate his instructions for his children. 
And it's interesting because in Romans 11, we're grafted into Israel. And if you look at other uh, millennial passages of after the return of the Messiah, that we see the, the New Jerusalem and we see the temple, how many gates does it have? Twelve. And well, where's the Gentile gate? Uh, right there, that statement right there, and what you see in Scripture just cut out the legs from a lot of Christian theology that has been built up that ignores the whole counsel of God and picks and chooses what it wants to believe rather than going for the full meal deal. Okay, so it's really interesting. So the people that end up saying, you know, well, uh, you know, what, what about the seven Noahide laws? There's inerrant problems with the seven Noahide laws because it leaves out charity. It leaves out uh, so many other things if you actually look at these things. And I just use some of these things as to, to awaken you to the fact that our Messiah, who said that we should be charitable, that's totally removed. In, he, God said be charitable in the Old Testament. He said it in the New Testament. And boom, we see it removed here for the seven Noahide laws. So that's something to be careful of. Now it's interesting because uh, when we talk about being obedient to God, generally as believers, if you ask a Christian, should we be obedient to God? Yeah, yeah, we should. Should we be rebellious and disobedient to God? Oh, no, 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 we shouldn't. Okay, so if God said, um, don't use this pencil on a certain day, um, and he told you that, would you be obedient or disobedient? Well, of course I would be obedient. I, I wouldn't touch that on that day. Okay, so if God said use this on a certain day, on a very specific day, would you do it? Oh, yes, I would, because God gave me that instruction, and I love him, and I'd obey him. But yet, when God says to observe the Sabbath for the foreigners and the Israelites who follow and sojourn after God, that the Sabbath shall be a perpetual covenant. In other words, it means forever. It transcends the test of time, and we even see it, see it after the return of the Messiah. Again, go back to Isaiah 66 and Zechariah 14 and other passages. Um, people say, nope, I'm not under the law anymore. Isn't it interesting that Jeremiah 31 says, I will write my law in your hearts and minds. Not part of it, not a little bit of, of it, not only seven, just seven parts of it is going to be written on your hearts and minds, but all of it will be written on our hearts and minds. So who are we to dictate and say that was what was once holy and a sign between us and God has now been done away with? It's all because we say, well, I'm under grace, I'm not under law. Okay, uh, I only have to follow the things that, that Jesus mentioned. And, and you know, don't murder uh, and don't hate your brother in your heart. Leviticus 19.17 actually talks about that because Yeshua re referenced that Levitical, uh, Leviticus 19.17. says, don't hate your brother in your heart. Oh, he didn't make up a new law. He went back. That's why he preached repent or perish. But yet so many people say, well, I'm not under law. I'm under grace. So does the, here's the thing is that does obedience, can you be obedient to God and sin? Hmm. Can you be obedient to God and sin? No, because sin is the transgression of God's law or transgression of his commandments. So when we look in the Old Testament, we look in the prophets, uh, you know, at the, at the times, of uh, future times and in all times, how God says that those who don't observe his Sabbath, that's an abomination before him. Why is it suddenly now, as a new covenant believer, how come I'm not, I'm not under any obligation to be obedient? See, the problem is we've been brainwashed and most people don't even know what the Sabbath is. First of all, you have to study and research God's word, not the tradition and commandments of men is what Yeshua warned people about. Uh, why do you, you know, uh, he told the Pharisees, you know, hey, you do all these things and why do you value this? You tied this men and this dill and all this stuff, but you're ignoring the weightier matters of the law. Why, you know, the washing of hands on the Sabbath, you know, the Pharisees came up to, to Yeshua and says, why, why don't you Pharisees wash their hands? As they're, it wasn't that they were picking the wheat uh, from the fields and eating it. That was lawful. That was, that was okay. Jesus never sinned. 
He was being obedient. But what the Pharisees said is that, how come your, your, your disciples aren't washing their ways in the prescribed way that you're supposed to have the secret decoder ring handshake with the water? How come they're not doing that? And he, he, he dived them out. He said, that's a tradition of men. That's a commandment of men. That's not the commandment of God. So there's a difference between the tr commandments of men and the traditions of men versus the instructions and the commandments of God, which he gave instruction. Okay, but a lot of people don't understand that. Um, and I was one of them. One interesting thing is that people say, well, we're not supposed to follow, the, follow those instructions. Really? Okay, so we're only supposed to do the things that Yeshua talked about. Don't hate your brother in your heart. Don't commit murder. Uh, don't commit physical act of adultery. But don't think about adultery. Hmm. Okay. And a couple other things. So, according to some believers, they say that's all we have to do is follow what, what Jesus said. Okay, well, what about bestiality? He didn't mention bestialism. He didn't mention rape. He didn't, uh, which isn't an act of adultery. It is an act of violence. There are so many things that Yeshua did not talk about, but they'll say because he didn't mention those things that we're now no under obligation to obey those things. That's wrong. Silence does not mean that it's been done away with. What we see is Yeshua was a Torah observant, Sabbath keeping, uh, kosher, biblical eating Jew, and he obeyed the commandments of the Father. And Paul says that follow me as I follow Christ. Hmm. So isn't it, now this brings into, into mind what's really interesting. And for the longest time, I said, you know, uh, Colossians 2.16, let no one judge you in regards to what you should eat or drink or new moons or Sabbaths or festivals or whatever. That means I can eat whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. I can, if I want to do the Sabbath, I can do the Sabbath, or I don't have to do the Sabbath. In other words, it just removed my responsibility from being obedient to God in any way, shape, or form. Because I do it as it's laid on my heart. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, that's not what that passage is about. The book of Colossians was written to believers at Colossia, uh, where the surrounding people were what? pagans. And the pagans were the ones that were trying to get them to stop from eating the way that God told them to eat, to instruct them to eat, to stop from observing the feasts of God, to stop from observing the Sabbath of the Lord, which he said was a perpetual covenant, the feasts of the Lord, which he said which would be forever, as we saw in Zechariah 14 and other passages that talk about after the return of the Messiah. So it was saying, don't let these pagans judge you for what God told you to do, which is right and pleasing before him. Because if God gave it as an instruction, and sin is transgression of the law, then if we obey his instruction, what does scripture say? We're blessed. Imagine that. So it's really interesting uh, how that comes about. But going back to the food thing, God instructed his children on, here's some things that are good for you for food. Okay? In other words, he created us. He formed us. He knit us in, in the whole nine yards. So God is all-knowing, all-powerful. Uh, he knows everything about you. So if he knows what is good for your body, for food, to be optimal for your immune system, uh, for protein, for, digest for digestion, uh, for keeping away the bugs and the yuckies in the whole nine yards, uh, he knows what is good for food, and he knows what is not good for food. So if we eat the good food that he said is good for us, which is interesting because, uh, you know, people say, well, we can cook pork any way we want. You know, back then they didn't know how to cook pork. That has nothing to do with it. There was actually a study uh, that was done in, in the early 1950s. There was this doctor who did studies, and I can't remember his name, so you have to forgive me, but uh, I've read his reports, and it showed how the toxicity of clean versus unclean animals. And what it ended up showing is that all the clean animals had the lower toxicity level than the unclean animals because they're scavengers. They're kind of like the garbage disposals, the sewers of the world, uh, the crabs, um, you know, the carrion, the vultures, the hawks, uh, you know, all the animals that kind of clean up and eat dead things and dead animals and get rid of the disease and the pig and the pork, which is highly toxic to individuals in this, this uh Man, what was the guy's name? Oh, 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 I really wish I remember what that guy's name was. But I'll see if I can find it, and I'll post it up on, uh, hopefully as a link. But uh, it was in 1950 or 1953 was uh, this study. 
it was conducted about clean and unclean animals. I'll, I'll try to find it, but it's out there. Um, but it's interesting is when we start saying, you know, well, we can eat whatever we want. Well, God says, go ahead. There are some, the scripture says, now here's another deep thing that's going to blow a lot of people away. There are some sins that do not lead to death. But sin is transgression of the law, and the law when it's full grown, give birth, it brings about what? Death. So is God bipolar? Is our theology off? Which is it? I think it's our theology is off. But there are some things that if I eat a pulled pork sandwich, am I going to die right there? No. We see people who have eaten pork and live to be 110, 120 years old. Okay? But it still does damage to the system. Now, the quality of the life and the individual, if they had eaten clean animals, that God said, hey, eat these. These are the most beneficial things that you can eat, uh, that you'll have long life and a better quality of life. Probably. I'm going to take God's word for what he said rather than saying, you know, oh, we, don't, we can eat whatever you want. Well, it's true. Eat whatever you want, but there's going to be that cause and effect relationship. Um, so it's pretty interesting about that. Uh, there's definitely some things that if you eat better, we see that with the increase, the, as we look throughout history, that the closer that we are to God and his instructions and those people who followed those instructions, the healthier they were. When we get further and further away from God's word and we eat whatever we want, we do whatever we want, we behave like the world and do whatever we want, we act as lawless people as if God had given no laws whatsoever, we snub our nose at God and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make up the laws now. Who are we to make up the own laws? We're not the lawgiver. We're not the one uh, who created everything. The one who creates a thing is the one who has the authority and the power. We are the creation. We were bought with a price. So we are no longer our own. We are no longer operating under our own authority. Yet many Christians and believers today are doing that exact same thing. And the whole thing is, is that some people say, well, I don't follow the list of rules. We're not supposed to follow the list of rules. We're supposed to have a relationship with God. And we use God's word that if I am transgressing one of his instructions or commandments, that shows me that in my heart there's something that I haven't submitted to God. So I need to repent. I need to ask forgiveness. So that that relationship that I have with him is not strained. Okay? Now, some people will say, well, oh, because you eat... You eat what the Old Testament of God, what he says there that you eat. You're saying that you're more blessed than me? You know what? Um, let's put it this way. If you hire somebody and to do some yard work for you, and you, you both agree that you're going to pay this person $50, and they do the work, and all of a sudden you, you decide, well, I'm, I'm just going to pay him $40, are you blessed? Or are you cursed? Hmm. That's a good question because people don't consider that blessings and cursings radiate out from us into other people. So if I don't pay this person what I agreed upon, not, not let your yes be yes and your no be no, you've already, all sin is transgression uh, against a holy and righteous God. So we sin against God, first of all, so that's wrong. We sin against our neighbor by not paying what we uh, agreed upon. So now that person who we gave the $40 to instead of the $50, he goes back to his family. He's not able to provide for his family. So we have cursed that individual, and that curse is permeating through his family. He can't feed his family. His family can't take that, that extra $10, perhaps uh, give, to, give charitably uh, to people who need it, the poor and the needy, the people who need clothes or, or orphans and widows, because you shortchanged them then it ripples out beyond that as well. So curses can go on to third and fourth generations. Blessings can also go to third and fourth generations. Does it make more sense now? But it all should be done from the heart in the relationship that we have with the Father. Just people say, well, you know, you're not supposed to follow those instructions, Joe. Those are, those are for, the, for the Israelites. No, uh, it was given to both the Jew and the foreigners who sojourned after God, who followed God out of Egypt. And it continues on today. We have one flock, we have one bride, and in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it says there is one law. Romans 11 says we're grafted into Israel. So it's interesting on how we will separate ourselves from God and his instructions 
and we think that we're free, that we're free from the law of sin and death. We are, if we're obedient. If we do not transgress the law, if I don't commit adultery, I'm not trapped in that, that curse of adultery, which affects me and my relationship with God primarily, and that after effect of interrupting the relationship between me and my family members, and then them and their family members, and the friends and, and, and people around me, that is a curse that is passed on. But if I'm obedient and I don't commit that adultery because I, I know that it's not righteous and pleasing before him, and I was bought with a price, so who am I to make up the rules? I love God, and through a byproduct of my heart, I obey those instructions that he gave. Guess what? I'm blessed because I don't have those consequences from that sin, that transgression of that commandment or law. Same thing as I brought it up over and over again. Can you obey God and sin? No. You're either obedient or you're disobedient. Look at the parables of the sheep and the goats. Look at the parables of the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. You see that essence, that aspect of obedience and disobedience. And those who are disobedient, they're the called the lawless ones. Paul even says, uh, do we do away with the law that grace may abound? By no means we establish the law in our lives. In other words, we establish a pattern of behavior of obedience to the Father because we know that that disobedience separates us from God. We're still saved by, by grace through faith, but as a new believer, as a new creature in Christ, are we supposed to be obedient or disobedient? We're supposed to be obedient. So it's interesting that uh, a lot of people, when we talk about the subject of, of obedience, when we talk about God's instructions, and people reduce it down to, to seven the Noahide laws, that has no place in a real believer's life. Because what you're doing is you're shortchanging God. You're missing the mark in so many different areas of which you can be a blessing to people by being obedient. Because God pours it on your heart. Now, here's the thing. I didn't understand this, but... If you're trying to follow all these things and it's not a byproduct of the love that you have for God in your heart, you're just like a Pharisee because you're not doing it because of God who's in you. You're doing it because you're trying to, to, to do some works to show God how, how righteous you are. It doesn't work that way. We have to be forgiven. He has to be in our heart, and he and the Holy Spirit works through us. Just as the law was poured out on Mount Sinai, we even see evidence of the law uh, the law. Well, that was only the law on Mount Sinai. That was the Ten Commandments and all those other laws, the 613. There's more than that, okay? That was just a, it was a categorization of, of some generally good things. There's actually more, okay? So don't get bent out of shape and say, oh, there's 613. No, there's actually some more there. Uh, it's just a list of what people came up with, said, well, this is a law, this is a law, this is a law, we should follow, and this is a law. Good rule of thumb, but if you have a relationship with the Father, Father, it transcends any list that is out there, whether it's 7 or 613. Because you're going to love God and you're going to love your neighbor, and there's going to be things there that you're going to do that isn't a law that God has laid on your heart and told, and told you to do. It's not going to conflict with Scripture. It'll never do that. But it'll be things that you might not even see in Scripture. But God has led you to do those things because you, you're being obedient, you're being loving to God, and he's going to show you how to love the people around you. But what's interesting is in, in talking about, the, it's interesting because people say, well, that's, we're not under the law anymore. Now remember, it's the law of sin and death. If we're obedient, there is, there is no consequence for being obedient except for blessing. There is no sin and death. There is no death. Okay? Um, so many times, and I did this exact same thing, is I ended up, uh, when people would say the same thing, you know, well, man, check out the Sabbath. How come you don't observe the Sabbath? One, I didn't even know what the Sabbath was. I thought it meant going to church. Uh, oh, how wrong I was. Um, but yet I said, well, Colossians 2.16, let no one judge you in regards to Sabbath or new moon. I, I even made videos talking about that. Hey, God hasn't laid it on my heart because I was ignoring his instructions, so I did what I felt in my heart was right. But what does Scripture say? The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? So we have to go back to the standards of God. And then when I started studying the Sabbath, and I started studying all these things and seeing that, yeah, these are perpetual covenants. These things are forever, without end, everlasting. But yet, who am I to say that now there's a pause, there's a stop, I don't have to do them. I'm exempt 
because I'm an adopted child of God, I don't have to follow the same instructions as the natural born children? That's crazy. But God is in his mercy and his love, and a lot of mercy, and uh, his discipline, his correcting and training in righteousness showed me in his word that um, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's interesting because I would bring up and I would, I would bring up these little scriptures as so many people say uh, as an excuse as, as to not be obedient to God, uh, to not even consider uh, what he put in his word. But it was all out of context. So I would choose the ones that would, that would you know, the words of Paul that would say, see, we're not supposed to, to follow the, uh, the law of sin and death. We're not under the curse of the law to support my rebelliousness and disobedience. And yet I'll ignore the ones where it says, you know, do we make void the law through, through grace? No, we establish the law in our life. No, 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 la, 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 la. I don't want to hear that because it conflicts with my uh, denominational teaching that has been passed on to me that, that I hold on to because I want to still continue in sin. I don't want to submit to the Father. I don't want to play by his set of rules for his children. I don't want to be that rebellious teenager. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. And another thing that was interesting is that I would throw out the, well, what about Galatians? What about Galatians? What about Galatians? What about Galatians? Now, yeah, see, Galatians, that proves it. Like Galatians is the silver bullet of suddenly now Galatians has more authority than all the other books of the Bible. That's wrong. Okay. First of all, we see these aspects and we see these scriptures talking about uh, being obedient to God. Revelation 14, 12. Uh, Revelation 22, it talks about, you know, uh, the, uh, what is it? In Revelation, it talks about here's the endurance of the saints, of those who keep the commandments of God and have faith in the Messiah. That's uh, Revelation 14, 12. Uh, Revelation 22 talks about that those who, in the end who have access to the tree of life are who? Are who? Those who obey the commandments of God. That's a blur right there for a lot of people. Because, and the thing is, a lot of, a lot of pastors won't even teach on Revelation. They will, they will totally ignore. There are some Bible commentaries that will totally ignore those passages that we just talked about. Let alone talk about 1 John, where it says, if we love God, we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Which goes back to Deuteronomy, which God says, what I have given you today, all these commandments, these laws, instructions, precepts, statutes, nothing I have given you is too difficult for you. It is easy. It's not up in the heavens or down below, but it's in you, it's near you, it's in your mouth. You can do it. But yet we choose sin over obedience. The thing is that God, when he poured out his spirit, and when the Messiah came, uh, well, the Messiah came, and we got our sins forgiven, and he's written his law in our hearts and our minds, according to Jeremiah 31. That's what God said. Don't argue with me. Argue with God. And then when the spirit was poured out on Pentecost, uh, Jewish feast, imagine that. Um, it's interesting that the Spirit was poured out. So the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, who guides us into all truth, and Paul says, you know, the, the, the law is holy, righteous, and true. And we see other passages where your law is truth, your instructions are truth, they're holy, they're righteous. Um, so now suddenly they're not righteous, holy, and true. So God's schizophrenic, he's bipolar. Which one is it? Once we become a believer and we have the Messiah in us and we're in him, when we're obedient from the heart, guess what? His Holy Spirit and his instructions combine together with him and us to walk in obedience just as he walked. Wow. Why do you think the term Christians was coined? It's because believers who are walking as the Messiah walked, it was used as a term of, of ridicule. There goes one of those Christians. Why? Because those people walked like the Messiah. So it's supposed to be an insult. But yet somehow we've gotten away from being obedient to God and his word and his instructions. And we've turned it all around where we've taken actually, I'm a Christian. But I'm disobeying all this stuff that God told me to do. Because of Galatians. Galatians is a huge book. It is complicated. Even Peter talks about Paul and his words and how difficult they are to understand because he deals with the law of sin and death versus the law of God. Are we supposed to do away with the law? No, we're supposed to establish it in our lives. Are we supposed to follow the, the commandments of men? No. Or the law of sin and death? In other words, are we supposed to operate and continue to break God's law? No. There is the big thing right there. 
There's a big, there's two different areas there. As believers, obedient or disobedient. That's what Paul's talking about. But Peter referenced that in 2 Peter, talking about how, how Paul's words are so difficult for those who are ignorant. It's hard to understand. He's a complicated because it's dealing with these things of obedience and disobedience. And he was addressing certain questions. In Galatians, here's a, a general overview of what Galatians is really about. Instead, and what I used to do was cherry pick verses out to support my, my disobedience, my uh, lawful disobedience to God's instructions, as I so called it, uh, as I call it now. But I would pull stuff out of context when I didn't realize or understand that Paul was defending the gospel of saved by grace through faith, and that's, that's how we're saved. Nothing else can be added to that salvation. And yet in Galatians, what he was addressing is those people who are saying, you got you to have the Messiah, but you got to obey the commandments of God, and you got to be circumcised. They added additional things onto the requirements for salvation. But yet the thief on the cross, he didn't obey the commandments. He, would, he might not even have been circumcised, but he believed in the Father, saved by grace through faith. He wasn't even baptized. Oh, that just ruined a lot of, lot of denominational theology there for a lot of people. Oh, you have to be baptized to be saved. Yep, thief on the cross. Sorry, God messed up your man-made traditions again, you know. So in other words, people are saying that you have to be baptized to be saved? Ooh, well, wait a second. Well, it says, you know, uh, him and his whole house were baptized and they were saved. Well, obviously they had their opportunity, so they made that public proclamation. What did the thief on the cross do? He made a public confirmation or, or confession that, hey, he's God. He's the son of God. And Yeshua said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So it's interesting on in how we'll make up our own traditions. But really what Paul was talking about, yeah, you're, you, the one thing was you're saved by grace through faith. Through the Messiah, that's it. That's the gospel message. All our filthiness is our right, our best righteousness, the filthy rags, where none of us are righteous, and uh, the whole night no one is righteous, not even one, but we're saved by grace through faith. What Galatians is about is those who are adding to that gospel message by putting obedience to the law. And you'll even read the, the, the verses in Galatians where it says, these people who brought about this additions to salvation, they weren't even obedient to God's instructions. Paul even talks about it where he says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but doing the commandments of God is what matters. That just blew a lot of denominational theology right there. Be hearers of the word, not don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. In 1 John, if we love God, we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. There's so many other passages in, in 1 John. It's just amazing. 1 John 1 and 3. Just read all of 1 John. Uh, you'll, you'll get it. <laughs> okay? But it's interesting because that's kind of the, what's going on in Galatians. The true gospel versus uh, the gospel with a bunch of additions on there. Okay? Which isn't a gospel at all. Okay? But some people... What they don't understand is they'll say, well, see, Paul's talking against the law. Yeah, if you try to use it as justifying yourself or try to attain salvation by works, yeah, it's never going to work. And that's what we see in Scripture. We're saved by grace through faith, and then when we become a new creature in Christ, are we supposed to be obedient or disobedient? I don't know. When the books are opened in the end in Revelation, you have the Book of Life and some other books that are opened and... I don't know. I imagine probably one of those books is going to be whether you're obedient or disobedient. Hmm. There's probably a book of the people that aren't going to be in heaven. They're going to be amidst the wailing and gnashing of teeth. Maybe. Just saying. So, the problem is we take so much out of context to support a denominational belief system. And the thing is, is that people, when they get to their last rope, they'll throw out that, well, what about Galatians? Galatians isn't the silver bullet because we see aspects of Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, who said the law is holy, righteous, and good, and that it's actually beneficial if it's used in the right way. In other words, if you obey the instructions of God from the heart, 
Hmm. It's not sin. It's a blessing. And then as we are blessed, we're supposed to bless other people. But if we try to hoard God's word, if we try to hoard uh, what little grace, love, and favor that he has shown us, and yet while we thumb our nose at God and we're disobedient, then we wonder why we're not being blessed. We're wondering why we don't have that peace that passes all understanding. We have people that will, and I was one of them, I'd throw up all these excuses, these out-of-context scriptures. I don't want to do that. Scripture says I, I can do whatever I want. Colossians 2.16. You're missing the mark. I was blowing it. But I can tell you 100% without a shadow of a doubt, the relationship that I have with God, He's done that. Saved by grace through faith. Nothing, nothing that I have done. He, he's done it all. But as a new creature in Christ, when you start walking in obedience, because God lays it on your heart, not because it's a list of rules, but because law, God lays it on your heart to be obedient or to observe those things, you will find blessing. It's not going to be a Bentley or a multi-million dollar house like some TV preachers have, uh, you know, or a Learjet or any of that crap. Um, Maybe God does that, but for the majority of what we see, the gospel, the word of God that permeates the world is that, you know, look at those third world countries where all those people are dying. And all of a well, they're not being blessed. They don't have mansions. They don't have their jets. Oh, that's because they have sin in their life. What? They're not being blessed of God because they have sin in their life because they're, they're poor. Because One TV preacher said those people are poor because uh, there's sin in their life. That's crazy, okay? Because I've been overseas. I've been to a lot of countries overseas. And I've seen people that are dirt poor who believe in God, have the awesome relationship with Him, the Father, even though they don't have food to eat. They have a better relationship with God than the majority of the Christians here in the United States in this American Christianity that says, I don't have to be obedient. It's like a rebellious teenager. I've never done that. And I'm still rebellious in many ways, shapes, or forms. But the thing is, I've learned that and it's all because of what God showed me. It's not what I've done. It's what his word has showed and laid on my heart to say, hey, look, stupid, do what I say. I'm a loving father. I give these instructions because I love you, because I want to see you blessed. But because of our denominational beliefs, and most of us are at least for me, I can speak for me, is that, oh, I don't have to follow that. I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. No, I'm, I'm under grace. I'm not under law. How many years I've wasted by following the commandments and traditions of men, the teachings of men, that while they had good intentions, they weren't following the word of God. And when... When, I, when me and my family started seeing the Sabbath, and we saw all these things, it's perpetual covenant, it's forever. And we saw it in Zechariah, we saw it in Isaiah, and the, after the Messiah comes back, and we saw all these things, and it's like, mm, he said it's forever. We see it in the future. Why is it stopped now? We were grafted into Israel. And the Sabbath, and the Feast of the Lord, it's not a Jewish thing. It's a God thing. The problem is, I put myself in a box. And I ignored his word. And it was to my, my detriment, to my family's detriment. And all I know is that I've been blessed since I've repented, confessed, and I've started actually following those things that he's laid on our heart. We studied hard on saying, well, what the heck is the Sabbath? Isn't it just going to church? No, it's not. I'm not supposed to think on the things that I want to do or pleasures, pleasures, things that pleasure me, uh, you know, think about the things that I want to think about. No, it's supposed to be time in that relationship between you and God and you and your family with God, discipling your family. How many people disciple their family members, spend time teaching God and his word to their wife or their children? There's a lot of pastors that don't even do that. There's a ton of pastors that don't do that. And yet God says, hey, this is a time for you to rest. Yeshua said, I am, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He didn't say he was the Sabbath. And the Sabbath continues on in the new millennium. A thousand year reign and even after that. 
So who am I to think, yeah, well, my pastor or my Bible college said that, you know, we don't have to do those things anymore. <laughs> you need to check with God's Word. So I know this has been an extremely long video, but when I looked at those no hide laws and I saw, you know, well, as long as I'm a good person, I should be okay. God doesn't want a good person. He wants a person in which he can have a relationship with. He died for you. He paid the price for you. So we're not our own. And you're a, you're a slave to whom you obey. So who are you obeying? If sin is transgression of God's laws, take that. Examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith and see where you need to repent, confess, and, and die to that, that wicked self. In that part or area of your life. And I know for a fact, here's the thing. For the guys out there, there's a lot of guys out there that have problems with substance abuse, whether it's alcohol or drugs or prescription drugs or illegal drugs. Uh, for the guys out there that have problems with porn, ooh, that just hit a lot of people right there. It's interesting on how many times I'd fall on my face, sin before God again and again and again. I transgress that, that, that law, that commandment of God, don't, don't covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's man's uh, maidservant or whatever. The lust in your heart. Because if you've done that, you've coveted your, your neighbor's female people, <laughs> and you've blown it, just as if you physically committed that act. So it has to be a circumcision of the heart. As I was in a state of rebelliousness and and refusing to be obedient to God's instructions, I couldn't overcome a lot of those things. But when I started seeking God, seeking Him first, and as He laid those instructions on my heart, and I started being obedient, and keep walking as the Messiah walked, and I brought my family into this, you know what? Those things, those sins that had such a deep hold on me, they started falling away. And I was able to repent, to truly repent, and to be like a stranger in a strange land. That that thing that I had so much problems with, I keep going back again and again and again, and I, I cried before God, and then I got numb before God, and I said, oh, I'm sorry. I could truly repent. I was able to walk in obedience. I was able to walk in victory. Able to walk in the blessings of God that I wasn't caught up in those sins. And I didn't revisit them over and over and over again. Because what it did is in that obedience, it brought me closer to him. That's the best way that I could say it. And that in that reaffirmed, reestablished relationship, he was in me, I was in him. So now I'm being changed by the washing of his word. I'm being changed by understanding the disobedience and the obedience. And when you walk in obedience, there's blessing. And you can stay that, that narrow path that leads to salvation. And so those temptations that came up, they fell away. Because he changed my mind, he changed my heart to see things as he sees them. Not all the way. I'm no, there's no way that I'm even there totally. But he's shown me that if I walk in obedience to him, these sins that I had, that I was continually doing over and over again, trampling on the grace of God for an occasion of the flesh, ugh, multiple times, grieving the heart of God, doing what was not pleasing in his sight, that changed. And there has been freedom, being able to walk in that law of liberty, obedience. So think about it. If you're having problems, and I get a lot of people that email me, a lot of people that send me PMs that, hey, I'm struggling with this addiction, this, I'm struggling with porn, I'm struggling, you know, with so many different things. And it's like mostly men issues, but women have these issues too. It's called romance novels. Um, it's the same thing. 
Look at, your, look at the sin that is in your life that you keep doing over and over again, and then look at your life and say, am I being obedient to God and his instructions? How, how obedient or disobedient am I being? And you'll see there's a direct correlation, relationship with those areas. Because somehow we think as we grasp onto these seven laws or these certain things that I'm, I'm under grace, I'm not under the law, that I have given myself permission to sin. Because I don't think those, those laws and instructions apply to me. I'm adopted into the family of God. And we use that adoption as being some red-headed stepchild that doesn't have to follow the same rules as the rest of the children of the house do. And that's where we make our mistake. Again, look at your life. Look at the sins that you're struggling with. Look at how obedient or disobedient you are. And you'll see, if I'm really disobedient to God and his instructions, the sin in my life is going to be more recurring and more prevalent in my life. But if I'm obedient from the heart, the more obedient I am, the less amount of sin or transgression of those commandments do I find myself in, in those things. So I'm able to walk in liberty, in freedom. Freedom from sin and death, which is obedience to his instructions. So for those of you who send me messages and PMs and saying, you know, oh, you're, you're, you're legalistic, you know what? All I know is I'm walking in blessings. I'm walking in things that I'm not caught up in the same sins over and over and over and over again. The proof is in the pudding. There's good fruit. You're going to have good fruit or bad fruit. So me, back then, when I held on to this, I'm saved by grace, I'm not under the law. I had so many problems with sin. But now I don't. Just saying. And I still have a relationship with God. <sighs> okay. So, that's enough rambling. I know I've talked a lot, but I hope some of these things... And if, you, if you're going to reply to this video by saying, well, this scripture says this, and you pull this out of context to support uh, being disobedient to God, just don't even do it, okay? Because I did that. And God showed me in his word where I was wrong, okay? So don't even try to, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want it to be like Colossians 2.16, but no one try to persuade you or judge you in regards to new moons or festivals or Sabbaths. Don't be that person who's trying to get me to be disobedient to God and his instructions. Put Colossians in context. Don't be that guy. I was that guy. And I apologize for being that guy. But again, test everything against God and his word. Not against what the pastor says or what some, some TBN preacher says or evangelist or whatever. Isn't it interesting that a lot of these television preachers are caught up in adultery and homosexuality and drinking and drugs and, and divorce and marrying and divorcing again and, uh, you know, mistresses and all this stuff and caught up in, in financial frauds and in the whole nine yards? Judge them by their fruit. Obedient? Disobedient. Good fruit? Bad fruit. Life, death, blessing, cursing. Everything's going to reproduce after its own kind. And remember, Yeshua said, for those who teach men the least of these commandments and teaches them to break them, they're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. But the one who teaches to be obedient and teaches men to, to obey those things and teaches others to do the same will be great in the kingdom of heaven. He said, I've come not to abolish the law. Or another tr translation, another uh, way of looking at it, if you look at all the definitions words, is I haven't come to falsely interpret God's word to make it void. I'm interpreting it as God has put it out to walk in obedience. That's powerful. Are we interpreting God's word so that sin continue to reign in us? Or are we walking in obedience to be his children 
strangers in a strange land who aren't engaged in the wickedness and the lawlessness of the world. Just saying. So anyway, that's it. Take care. God bless.